Order! 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 You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! The Corbyn wing of the party is in a restrained mode. And one example of that was Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell's big conference address today. He said he wouldn't make his usual rant and he wouldn't make any jokes because they get him into trouble. Instead, he made what can only be described as the most radical departure from the mainstream political orthodoxy of any Shadow Chancellor for decades. We will tackle the deficit, but this is the dividing line between Labour and Conservative. Unlike them, we will not tackle the deficit on the backs of the middle and low earners, and especially not by attacking the poorest in our society. Well, the Shadow Chancellor was clear. He needs extra tax revenues, and he got one of his loudest cheers when he explained where those might come from. Labour's plan to balance the books will be aggressive. We will force people like Starbucks, Vodafone, Amazon and Google and all the others to pay their share of taxes. On specifics, well, he actually announced policy reviews, some led by experts. And that's because Mr McDonnell knows he has to do more than win cheers. He has to earn his credibility. But our radicalism comes with a burden, and we have to acknowledge that. We need to prove to the British people we can run the economy better than the rich elite that runs it now. Well, you've heard some clips there. I'm glad to say we have the Shadow Chancellor with us. John McDonnell, good evening. You've had a busy day. I wasn't going to quiz you in on much detail in your policy, but you described yourself in your speech today as a pragmatic idealist. Um, so really, trying to test whether you're more pragmatic okay. or more idealist. Okay. Um, first of all, you didn't mention the wealth tax today. You have talked about a wealth tax in the past. In fact, you'd suggested that you could get, I'm not joking here, £800 billion pounds from a wealth tax by taxing the top 10% of wealth owners. Are you still minded on wealth taxes? What we're going to do, you, you heard the speech, I've set up all these reviews. I'm, we're launching a review of HMRC, the tax, the tax Collection Agency. And including that review, we'll look to see whether the organisation's fit to pur for purpose, staffing, resources and legislation. But I want then to have the rolling out review of a whole range of taxation and see where we get to. There's a, lots of ideas bubbling up at the moment. Right. Land value tax, for example, some elements of wealth tax as well. Financial transaction tax has been discussed this week as well. So there's a whole range of debate that's going to happen. Right. Can I be absolutely clear, though, that... It's not going to be raising 800 billion of no, revenue. No. I mean, that, that, you talked about sort of halving the national debt. By well, it was, in, it was interesting. It was but a, it wasn't a one-year no, tax. That no, it, it wasn't. Was a, no. It was a piece of work by Greg Philo, the professor mm. up in Scotland, and I thought it was quite interesting that there was even a debate about wealth tax going on. So we're going to widen the debate on this whole range of issues. Right, but people shouldn't be scared. No, of I, no, no. no don't start leaving the country now. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, top rate of tax. Yeah. Um, now, you, you, Labour policy is 50p, that's, that's right. the kind of yes, default yes. where you start. Yeah. Yeah. But you have suggested today you're happy to see it go higher if, if, if the review takes I'm, it there. To be honest, I, income tax isn't the really my big interest. I'm more interested on issues around corporation tax and tax collection and tackling tax avoidance and tax evasion. So I'm not really interested in any, looking at above 50p. But that will be part of the debate. The whole process I was setting out today, I, as you saw in the speech, I was saying that we're going to go out, we brought these, this economic advisory body together with some of the most distinguished economists in the world. We're going to ask people for their ideas. We're going to test them. I'm going to ask G George Osborne if we can have access to the Office of Budget Review and to the Bank of England modelling. So everything we come up with, we want to test and test and test again. So when we go back into government again, Every instrument and every measure we introduce has been thoroughly thought through. I mean, interesting question of principle on the top tax rate, which I'd be interested in your view on, is when they cut it from 50 to 45p, which mm. I think you oppose, mm. the Office for Budget Responsibility, and you're accepting their credibility, you want them not to test your policy. Actually. Hang on, they not said that, that only cost the government £100 million. Pounds. Yes. I mean, a big tax cut for yeah. a lot of people, and, and it cost nothing. Now, would you... Would you want to cut it? Would you want to raise a tax even if they told you it wasn't going to raise any money? Well, one of the things I want to open up is the debate around the modelling that's been going on, both in terms of the Bank of England and the OBR. There's a debate going, it's a quiet debate going on within the uh, Bank of England at the moment. I believe it's being led by Mr Haldane about the accuracy of some of this modelling that's been going on. So, again, what I've, what I've said, when we go back into government, 
I want to ensure we invest in appropriate modelling so we get the answers right. I'll give you an example of that. George Osborne said he'd reduce the deficit within five years. He hasn't even done half of that within one term. And I think the reason he made that statement is because there's actually the assessment and modelling was inaccurate. I don't think he was kidding people. I just don't think he got the sums right. Right, but you're not saying that you would expect any amount of modelling at the Bank of England to actually produce an accurate forecast. The world is a noisy place. I think it can be... Things are knocking the ship well, off course yeah, the whole course time. Come on, you're But not... on something like tax, you can have a better distributional analysis of implications. Right. And up until now, I'm not satisfied that it's been sufficiently accurate okay. on issues around that reduction. You're making enemies a bit with the Bank of England and with the Office of Budget no, Responsibility no, by no, saying really. these things. No, 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 no You don't really, see it no. that way? It's a constructive debate. No, right. I, I honestly want okay. to engage in that discussion. I want to make sure the economists that we've brought together, the Stiglitzers and all the rest of the world that we've brought together today, has a good relationship with the Bank of England, but they've got to open their doors. That's why I want to get access to their modelling processes. Right. OK, look, the next one, which I think was quite interesting, was nationalisation and whether there would be compensation. Because we're only talking like... It's, it's a long time ago in politics, but we're only talking like a month or two ago. Mm. You were talking about um, speculators need to know that if they're trying to make a fast buck... I if they yeah. buy these assets at below good prices, the Treasury, the Labour government will reserve the right to bring them back into public ownership with either no compensation or with any undervaluation deducted from what they're paid. I, I think it's an important question for some people. Can they be sure that if they buy assets from George Osborne at the price George Osborne chooses to sell them, that they will be compensated by a fair market price if you choose to buy okay. them back? On the nationalisation issue, let me just say the commitment that we've given is about rail renationalisation right. when the contracts fall out, so that will be cost-free. So you don't buy it back? That no, easy. that will be yeah. absolutely cost-free. Yeah. Yeah. But I've, I've got a sense of frustration about the sales that are taking place because the frustration is that if you're selling things below value, we're being ripped off. Mm -hmm. RBS, what the calculation is, 7 billion we're losing. Royal Mail was a billion below the others thought that was the appropriate price and I have a sense of frustration and I'm trying to find a way in which we can advise people actually there can be some redress for this in the future so if there's a knockdown sale a below price by George Osborne I want to see if there's a mechanism now that we can actually say we're going to address this when we come to government when I'm implying that the value of I don't know, something like Royal Mail is some fixed absolute oh, there's course. a sort of everybody knows what it is and they've just sold it below that no, but you Actually, can... it's much more complicated. No of one really it. knows what Royal Mail's worth. They're well, all making a bit of a it guess. Is, it is more and complicated than that. It is more complicated. It's not a simple issue. But there is a process where appropriate valuation has taken place. With, and you can judge that within a certain range. If it's well beyond that range, you know it's unreasonable. Do you know, when I was in local government years ago, if we went out and sold something below its value and it was proved to be an unreasonable act, we'd be surcharged individually. Mm. I'm not going to introduce but surcharge for the chief executive. Uh, uh, Bank of England or anyone else. Just to be clear then, so people who bought shares or have shares in Royal Mail, and they may not have bought it at the knockdown price, you're not thinking, though, no. that they will be punished. No, not they at all. They will be bought at the market I, price if you choose exactly, to buy it in exactly, the market. Exactly. So but what it's I'm, important for people to be reassured is, by that. Of course it is. But the way you've been talking, it almost implies that you are willing no, to No, I'm, war I'm warning George Osborne on this latest round of privatisations that he's bringing forward. We need to ensure that they're appropriately and properly assessed in value. There should be no below-cost sales in which have taken place in the past. I'm sending a warning to him that we're going to scrutinise that very carefully. And if I can find a mechanism in the future where something has been outrageously sold below the, the real price, we will try and get some compensation back. Right. From the people who buy it. Yes. Mm. Tobin tax. Mm. Last night, uh, it, it seems like a long time ago, it's been a long day, I think you said, the position is straightforward. Either we introduce a financial transaction tax, this is the Robin Hood tax, yes, this is, yes. it comes by a lot of different names, either we introduce it unilaterally, or it'll be done in Europe, or globally. Yeah. That implies it will be done. Now, this Labour, morning, yeah, yeah. You, were, you were saying we've got to have a review on this. That's a very different John McDonald's no, no, I don't think so. What I said last night was the Labour Party policy at the moment is to introduce a financial transaction tax on a consensual basis globally. However, when we consult about our future taxation, we would want to model whether or not at the European level it could be done and also model whether it does 
be introduced for the UK. And part of that modelling would be to assess the issue, the arguments that's been put against it, which it will somehow undermine the City of London and the financial standing of the country. Well, obviously, if it was going to do that, we wouldn't implement it. However, if we can model it in such a way we don't find those problems, well, maybe it's worth considering. So the debate so you, is wide so open. You left the impression yesterday that you were in favour I am in favour and it would happen no, I am in under favor. you but now it, you're not saying no, it will not happen. No, that's true. Look, I'm sorry, I've just listened to you and you've just said All right. if it can be modelled correctly you would like it to happen but if not it won't It happen. depends on which method we're using. Right. What, we, what I'm saying is I'm in favour of financial transaction tax, right. full stop. Whether it's a UK level, whether it's European or whether it's global will depend on whether or not when we model it which will be the most successful and which will cause, if there is any damage, right. to our, own, our economy. Now, at the moment... But if everyone else says, we don't want a financial transactions tax because it's not going to work, or the Americans aren't going to buy in, and if the Americans don't, it's no point in anyone else doing it. If everybody says that, is it possible there will be a financial transactions tax in the UK alone? If, if we model it in such a way right. that it is not damaging to our economy, it would be worthwhile. Now, I summarise that answer, John, as maybe. Isn't yes. that a maybe? Yes, right. there is a maybe. Whereas yesterday, I think it sounded like there will be, and it's no. today it's maybe. Let's be very clear the language I'm using. <laughs> right. Okay, I'm, I thought you were straight talking yeah. what we're about. No, and yesterday said, was it no. sounded like there will be, and today it sounds well, like maybe there no, will be. No, no, you've okay, got to I misunderstood. Okay. At the fringe meeting, yeah. I said the Labour Party policy is to introduce it okay. on a basic global basis, so that gives us the potential for doing it, and that's policy. However, the other couple of levels will do a proper assessment. I assured the conference today and the British people, everything we do, whatever instrument, whatever policy we introduce, will be tested, tested. and tested and tested, tested. again. And, and, and there's been a lot of reassurance today. And, and indeed, in this interview, I'm hearing quite a lot of reassurance, which a lot of people will be very pleased, I'm sure, to hear. Let's clarify your fiscal plans, because there's some confusion over the fiscal target. Will the party be voting with the government's charter for fiscal responsibility? You called it a trap today. Oh, I know. Look, I, I've, I've been in Parliament 18 years. Yeah. OK. I've never seen anything so surreal as this charter. Right. This is the, this is the Chancellor Exchequer coming to Parliament to ask Parliament to pass legislation to tell him to do what he's going yeah, to yeah, do already yeah. and right. then include in it is a get-out clause of normal times. We're going to, this debate, I think, is going to be farcical. I but understand we'll, all we will, you're saying. We will vote for it on the basis that we want to assure people that we will tackle the deficit, we will balance right. the budgets, we'll live within our means. So, just to be clear, you're going to vote for it, but your policy is not to balance the books on the level of borrowing. You're going to allow borrowing for investment, aren't you? Yeah, we are. Right. Yeah. So you're going to vote for a law which you think is A, stupid, and B, you have no intention of... Well, we're, we're going to have some fun with it, I have to say that, because right. I, I want to listen When well, you've to, clarified, well, I want to it's listen as clear to, as mud I, well, to I me, okay, well, I mean, what your view is. Well, I think George Osborne needs to come forward and tell us what it really right. means. For so example, you, what is the definition of normal times? I have no... It sounds like the old discussion okay. of what the economic cycle was. However, what we are trying to do is get the message out there that we will ensure Britain lives within its means. I mean, I've, I've been listening to you on all these issues. I've given you essentially a radical and a less radical mm. alternative, and you're mostly opting for the more reassuring one, which is to hold a review, to think about it. Which is equally radical. Well, it's, 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 of course it's, it's radical. More, We're having a review and engaging people. Is there such a people. thing as a pragmatic idealist? Is there really such a thing? Is there, if you just coined two opposite words, put them together and said, that's how I want to define myself. Is there such a thing? Yes, it's me. It's me. What I'm saying is we're <laughs> going to change our economic system, we're going to do it by bringing the people with, them, with us, but at the same okay. time we're going to be pragmatic because we'll test every step we okay. take to make sure it works. Just, just on the principle of capitalism, and I know you jokingly said you want to ferment in the sort of beer sense, ferment the end of capitalism. I want you to know whether you, the, the, the advice you would give to a British company, it can make its product, say, got a factory, can make its product more cheaply overseas, let's say Malaysia, China, somewhere like that. Should it make that product overseas and close the factory here or not? No, it shouldn't. No. Because actually in the long term, in the long term, what we're finding is those factories that have outsourced and gone elsewhere, some of them are now coming back. Because what's happening elsewhere is wages are beginning to rise and what they, that they then do is they find they need to relocate. So, so it would be better to have the stability of being in this country. So it, it was a mistake, really. Everything that went on in the growth of China in the last 15 years in which Western companies started making T-shirts and all those things much more cheaply in China and selling them back to us. Well, they're coming that, back. No, no, well, I mean, but I, they're coming back now. But, yes. they, but, but they had a good 15-year period while they're there. Now, was that all a mistake? Was it something that was a, a dysfunction 
of our economy, of Western economies, that companies chose to do that? Or was it great for Western consumers? They could buy clothes at cheaper prices That's and true. microwave ovens. Which, That's which true. I think it was a short-term gain with possibly a long-term cost. Because in the end, I think there could become consumer uh, loyalty to individual companies and individual products. And people are now asking the questions about how were these products made? Were they made as a result of exploitative labour? Were people paid the right cross? Were they made in health and safety conditions? And I think there's a backlash against the companies that have done that. Right, so if Dyson, for example, say, well, look, if we don't make our stuff in Malaysia, we can't export as much to the United States. You know, we've got a big operation in the well, UK, that's marketing feasible, and administration and design and all of that great jobs, well, that's perfectly incidentally. Appropriate, isn't it? So we put our factory in Malaysia, make it cheaply, and we can really sell a lot well, of years. If we keep it in, it's perfectly in Britain, well, it'll be no, more it's expensive. Perfectly, we won't perfectly, sell as much. It's perfectly appropriate to a company to have a satellite company elsewhere, located in the region that they're selling, or in close proximity to that. No one's complaining about that. No, but that. they're basically putting it in Malaysia, out of the UK, because they can make it more cheaply there to sell to us and to the Americans. It's, mm. a, it's just the... I think in the long term it's a mistake. I mm. think it, I think it under, you, undermines customer loyalty in that particular you, product in the yeah. company. I mean, is globalisation a mistake? The kind of integration of the global no, economy? It's, it's inevitable but, and I think we should gain from globalisation. But, but, but isn't everything you've just said about it being a mistake to cite your factory in the cheapest jurisdiction? No, not at all. Isn't that just the counter no, everything no, that globalisation no. is and stands no, for? No, globalisation shouldn't be about the exploitation of people. And what we're saying is globalisation should be the cooperation of nations. So when companies are operating in international markets, they should abide by the same standards as elsewhere. Do you think the Chinese workers, who saw the most stupendous growth that took them from being subsistence farmers in one generation to being middle-income industrial workers, was that exploitation of China or was that the biggest anti-poverty reduction thing that has happened in the history of the human well, race. Well, in, interesting enough, there was a brutality about that industrial revolution that, went, that took place in China, which I think was unfortunate. I think that they could have learned the lessons of previous industrial revolutions and not had the levels of exploitation that they did. Right. Um, that's uh, interesting. Thank you very much. Look, I want to talk a little bit off the... Um, uh, the economics. I mean, obviously, you've said lots of things in the past, and they're all catching up with you, and come everyone's on, been reading yeah, every, 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 everything. I'm going to start publishing uh, my back number, all, I think. It's all part of this, whether you're the real radical or whether I you're know, the, uh, or, or, or the pragmatic. Um, so you, you, you did say some words about inter, in, in, in insurrection, and they were, quite, yeah. uh, they were pretty clear. I, I'm sort of interested in what you meant, because this morning, not three years ago, this morning you cited UK Uncut, yeah. a campaign group, as having achieved something in drawing attention to corporate tax yeah. avoidance and yeah. evasion I think through that, direct action. I think it was a superb campaign. Mm. I, I'm a member of the Tax Justice Campaign. I was holding meetings in Parliament 10, 15 years ago. I don't think there was more than about half a dozen people there. We were getting nowhere. We were doing the good work, understanding the tax system, bringing in accountants, knowing what reforms we wanted, but we were getting nowhere in terms of argument. UK Uncut come onto the scene, they do a direct action campaign, all of a sudden they get the publicity, you then have politicians addressing it, all of a sudden they want to meet the tax mm. justice, and even George Osborne is now having to address right. the issue. And so, so, so if they go to Fortnum and Mason, and, and then at the end of their thing, whether it's them or whether it's the hangers-on, who knows, but the words Tory scum are... Well, that's right not right. right. Now, of course it's not You're right. You're against that. It's non Look, I'm in favour of non-violent direct right. action, simple as that. If it wasn't for non-violent direct action in this country, women would, women would not have the vote. We would not have trade unions. We would have not have a lot of our civil liberties. And on that basis, I'm saying to people, if politicians aren't listening to you, what, what can you do? We can take to the streets, but you do it in a non-violent right. way. So there was an anti-gentrification protest in Shoreditch in East London against the hipsters who seemed to have moved into that area, yeah. quite yeah. a poor area otherwise. But there was elements they of... broke, broke windows yeah, there. Yeah, that... You're just completely against that and you condemn that I, and you're I just, totally I, clear. Well, I, I say to people when, you, they, when, they, when demonstrations go to, into violence, you lose the ability to communicate what you're demonstrating for. So, and people immediately then were re resistant to the message. So it's counterproductive. So you're completely against all violent protest, essentially, yes, in, a, in a democracy or yes, in, 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 yes, in a democracy. I've learned that over the years, yes. Mm. I through experience. Mm. And, and that applies to the IRA. The campaign yes. they launched was not a legitimate campaign. My view, and I've said it time and time again, I've learned the lesson, actually, that violence doesn't work. Right. Mistakes were made on all sides within Ireland, all sides. And once you start resorting to violence, I think it, you then get entrenched within the community itself. And it's very difficult to then come out of that violent situation. Mm -hmm. People become traumatised and violence becomes the first response. So you just learn the lessons of experience in all this.
do you, you said you were not going to be able to give your usual rant today when you gave your speech. Mm. Do you miss the John McDonald who could rant and who didn't have to think quite so carefully about what he was saying? I've just done a number of fringe meetings where I have had a bit of a rant, so <laughs> watch the newspapers in the morning. <laughs> John McDonald, thanks very much thanks indeed. I've been getting away with it all.